thanks to Marion. Um, it took us a while to get here, as you know, all the chaos that reigns these days, but uh, great to be here with you. Um, thanks for coming on an early Friday, particularly World Cup Day. I know probably half of you were up watching the game, so thanks for getting up and, and um, coming and seeing me. So I'm Cameron Johnson. I've been in China since I was 19. Uh, I only came for a year and then never left, and I've kind of done a lot of things in my career, but in this case, we're going to go over some of the mapping supply chains and ecosystems that... Um, um, that I've done. And if you will give me just a brief intro, um, I am a professor at NYU part-time, and I also I run my own business focusing on supply chains and manufacturing. Um, Jessica over there and I, we did go to the same school. She says hello. Um, go UW. Um, yeah, on this part, basically, I ran a large manufacturer for many years here making carbon fiber. Now, carbon fiber goes into everything from the Boeing 787 to your tennis rackets, hockey sticks, you know, uh, probably the SUP boards you've ridden. If you've ever done skiing of any kind, it goes into all of those products. So over that time, I built up kind of a real broad scope of how supply chains work and I kind of took it into my current business. So what is mapping? Essentially, mapping, if you're a business, goes into how do you trace the product from A to Z. All right, it's actually that simple. Secondly, it's understanding the map of your network. You know, as you know these days, for example, if you take this cup, this cup probably went through 15 different processes. That's a lot. Now what happens if somewhere in that process there's an issue with the product that will affect everything in the supply chain moving forward? And then lastly, one of the areas that we look at is um, sourcing the materials of all, or what are the sources of all materials used in your shipment? For example, here, right, they're not, they don't have a, machine that makes cups, they just buy the cups off the market, right? Or maybe they have a special printer. Well, for them, as an example, you'd have to go back through the entire supply chain. Where does the printer get the cups from? Are they getting the cups from a reputable source? Are they actually using the right materials for the cups, right? Some of the cups, you know, they may have a certain uh, fill, or not filament, a certain uh, coating in them to hold water or coffee better than others, right? But is that hazardous? Is it not? Are they using the right one? Is it certified? There's all these questions you have in your supply chains. So why is it important? So in this case, we're going to look at Geely. Now, Geely is a huge automotive car company here, as you know. Their first foray overseas was into Australia. Now, initially, it was actually quite successful. It was a limited, I think it was about 40 or 50,000 cars, so not a lot, but it was pretty successful entry into the Australian market. And remember, this is the first time a Chinese com automotive company had ever gone overseas, so it was a big deal. But what they ended up finding is, is that suppliers were using asbestos. Now, if, you know, asbestos can cause cancer. Mm -hmm. And in the Western world at the moment, it's verboten uh, for probably since, I'd say, the early 90s, right? But here, particularly in certain um, processes and parts such as automotive, which are really, really hot, asbestos, at least at this time, was still allowed to be used. Obviously, you have a cross current there. So ultimately, what happened is, is somebody in Australia found out they had to recall all of the vehicles. They had to go through their supply chain and understand who was doing it where, and ultimately found that it was a sub-supplier. It wasn't even the actual supplier they thought it was getting from, but it, they thought they were getting the product from, but it was a sub-supplier that was doing this and created all of these challenges. So ultimately what happened is that supplier was kicked out of the network and then Geely went in and really um, put in a lot more traceability and documentation into the supply chain. Next we have the Mattel. Now for those of us who have kids, you know, toys are very important, but also is what do the toys contain? So in this case it was actually lead paint that led to, ultimately, this is actually an article I pulled, it ultimately led to about 20 million toys being pulled over several years because of the paint that was used. In this case, when they drilled down into it as a summary, again, a sub-supplier used paint with lead in it because it was umau cheaper than the other. Now, you know, what is umau? I don't know what that is. One cent, two cents, something like that. So even something as simple as that created all of this chaos through the supply chain, okay? So how do you start doing it? If you're in the business or you're interested, where does this stuff come from? How do I know I'm getting what I'm doing or getting what I need? First, you have to identify who are the key stakeholders, who actually are in the supply chain, right? Again, if we use the coffee, obviously they're at the end because they're, or we're at the end actually because we're the end user, 
they're, you know, they buy the cups, you know, how far do they go back? For example, you could ask them, so you get your cup, because it obviously has special printing on it, but is that special printer certified? Do they have any quality complaints? Where does that printer get the cups from? Is that factory then? So you, know, so you kind of go through all the supply chain and map it out. Who is touching the product at every point? Also understanding the relationships. What are the supplier's relationship? Do they have a 20-year relationship, a brand new relationship? Is this something where they go back and forth? Hey, don't worry, we'll offload these cheap cups to you because we know we can, you can use them with your customers. And sometimes that doesn't really matter, right? For example, I help build the Costa Coffee supply chain and oftentimes they would produce substandard cups that were used in various coffee shops in third and fourth tier cities in China, right, as an example. There was nothing wrong with it Costa Coffee's logo wasn't on it, but they had to do something with the cups. They're not, the factory's not going to get rid of them, right? Next is you establish the cost, timing, meaning how long does it take in each step of the process. For example, when they order cups, does it take two weeks to get here, a month to get here? You go back to the printer who's doing the cups. How long does it take them to get cups? So you have to kind of map out and understand the timing and how it affects the supply chains. What are the risks, right? And then data. And this is the issue a lot where, and data and, and, um, and risk kind of go hand in hand. Because part of the challenge in supply chains now is there really is no data. I have to tell you, three years ago, nobody knew the word supply chain. Now everybody knows it, right? Because we've seen how literally the supply chains globally have shattered. And one of the reasons is because is people did not know how much it cost or the time, where the risks were, or have any data about what they were getting. So this is a map, actually, of a uh, end use, an end user using something from a mine. So think of uh, CATL, right, batteries for automotive. You could think of just iron ore making construction materials. So this essentially is the entire map from front to end. These are the mines, then the processors, right, the refiners, and then you go all the way. Look at all the steps in this process. This map took three years for somebody to compile. Three years. And that's just one product, right? So again, when you look at where are things coming from, it's very important we understand and you ask questions, for example, in your industries, where did this come from? Where is the documentation? Now, I've gotten a lot of pushback in the last couple of years. Hey, you, for, you, know, you, you, for, you shouldn't be asking these questions. Like, no, no, no. The game has changed. Particularly after the PPE wars, everybody is fully aware of supply chain risk and accountability. Right? So, I give, I give you this example of kind of, this is some of the work we do. We didn't do this, by the way. This is, it's a lot of work. But this is some of the stuff my firm does where we actually will map out as best we can from beginning to end. So, for example, with a coffee company, we would go all the way back to where they even source the trees, as an example, to really understand the cost and the timing. And again, a lot of that exercise is not necessarily to move suppliers out or to get rid of you know, certain people or to change products, it's often I need to have visibility because what happens if this supplier goes out of business or what happens if I can't get the raw material, right? One of the biggest issues now, as you know, is chips, right? There's a lot of chip building everywhere, but people can't get raw materials. They can't get pieces of chips. The packaging is off. So this is a textile. Basically, if you make a shirt, so this goes all the way from the raw material, so think of a cotton, a polyester, something, and it goes all the way. This is essentially how it goes to the distributor. Think of a, I guess we don't have Gap here anymore, do we? You know? H&M. H &M? Well, we may not have them either very much. I don't, you know, anyway, think, think of a, <laughs> maybe the fabric market, maybe. So this is kind of, again, look at all the steps in this process. So if you are making, for example, your clothing retailer, most of the time, you would have your map to essentially here. You would know generally who's sewing the fabrics or, or, you know, or the clothing, and that's about it. And you were OK with that. But again, today, the world has changed. So now what we're seeing is companies um, go all the way back and force raw material. Now, the issue here, particularly in China or, or East Asia, is that raw material often is just sold by distributors and wholesalers. And even they may not. you know. Um, know where it comes from. I'll give you an example. Cotton, for example. Cotton's taken from all over the place and basically put in bundles and then sent to a mill, which is then you know, ground or refined to something, and they make thread out of it. Right? Well, how do you trace that? It's just all put together. Right? Now, there are ways you can do it with technology, but it's very difficult and it's expensive. So when you go to a supplier and say, hey, I want you to implement this, they're going to be, Oop. that's my alarm to uh, keep moving faster. Yes, thank you. <laughs> 
basically you can see here the process, right? And why it's important and how it affects business. So where are the risks? So this is kind of the, the five things I take into account, again, when I'm talking to customers or that you should. One, what is the supply chain and manufacturing trend? A lot of people, hey, everything's moving to Southeast Asia. Not really. It's not really. If you look at what's happening in supply chains, they're actually extending. So for example, they always use Apple. Apple went to India to, well, all the component parts are still coming from China. Right. All of the chips are still coming from Taiwan. So yes, they have a new facility there. They're assembling and they're using it for different things. But they're not taking capacity yet, at least, out of China. They're, t they're just using the current existing supply chain and ecosystem to feed that facility so they have other options. And India has domestic local required, you know, if you, you have to produce domestically in the country in order to be able to sell and have tax benefits. Next is what are the government regulations and political considerations? Think of the trade war, right, the U.S.-China trade war. Now, for Europeans and Japanese, to be honest, they loved it because they're like, hey, you Americans, pff, we don't have to worry about that. Here we are, you know, come by us. Which, again, that's important to know. What's the trend? Right. Next is the raw material. Where's the access? So this is one of the biggest issues at the moment. Where are you getting your raw material from? Now, a lot of that has to do with compliance, particularly politically now. A lot of it also has to do, there's a lot of substandard crap on the market. So where is it coming from? Do you know that supplier? Does your supplier actually know that supplier? Do they have a long-term relationship? Is there any documentation to show you that it actually is coming from you know, this particular mine or this particular supplier and it can be verified? Next is the workforce. We've all seen what's happening with the excitement in Foxconn at the moment, so that's always an issue. Can your supplier, do they have stable, not just a stable workforce, but if there's an issue, do they have a contingency plan to actually help resolve it in a, in a, um, a reasonable time frame? And then the last really is infrastructure, and this is where China actually excels against all other countries in the world. Right? If you look at a supply chain of manufacturing, you essentially need five or six components. One is raw material access, government support, an educated and skilled labor workforce, uh, advanced infrastructure, technology. Did I say raw material access already? I don't remember. You get that. Five or six, basically, that's what you need. China has all of that for most industries. The US has it for some industries. Japan has it for some. Germany has it for some. But all of the countries only have pieces of that puzzle. So again, when you look at the trends, OM oh, manufacturing is moving. That's true. Some is. But you have, to have, you have to look at actually what's happening. It's extending. Because all of that ecosystem exists in this country versus all the others. And then the last really is, if you want to do that, you know, whether it's in your own business, you know, your own home, where's my, where's my food coming from, whatever it may be, these are just some tips, right? Map it out as you know it. You, uh, you probably know far more than you think you do. You know, when you talk to your customers you know, or your suppliers, they probably know a lot more than they, they think they do as well. You know, drive uh, visibility, right? Try to visualize and ma actually map it out, A to Z, as we saw with the mining example. You know, build the map motivate the suppliers, recognize where your risks are, and remember, and this is an issue I constantly have, particularly here, I'm not here to take away your business. I'm here to give you more business because you will be able to say to all of your customers, hey, my entire supply chain is mapped out. We know where all the risks and costs are. This is why we're driving efficiency so you have a better product. By the way, my competitor doesn't do that. So it actually gives you a selling point to sell back, right? And then that's it. Thank you.